Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, we are discussing Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand. And today we are going to be talking about basic principles of literature. And this is in some ways really the core of the technique. Um, you see her apply her understanding to this medium of literature where she's the master. So it's really amazing to see you know, how theme, plot, characterization, and style play out in works of art. So look forward to exploring that with you. Delighted to have uh, Rob, Sherry, and Joya with us. So we're going to start with Sherry, then go to Joya, and then to Rob. And then we will, uh, you know, do Q&A, take, a, take a, you know, uh, breakout rooms and takeaways. So over to you, Sherry. Okay. Um, did, can I take a little rate, um, show of hands of how many people read the chapter this week? Okay, good, good. That, that, yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so the last couple of times I've been talking about how um, sometimes in, when we're talking about visual arts, Ayn Rand is using almost a shorthand or um, a telegraphic style Well, she'll tell you um, she'll jump from a high level abstraction or she'll jump from a, a detail in the work of art to a high level abstraction and not giving every step in between because as Rob keeps pointing out to me, this is a book of philosophy of literature and not of visual arts. Um, so this is where the, we really hit pay dirt. We're really getting the meat and potatoes of what she's talking about. Um, so I'm just gonna give it a super, super short um, review in my mind of what we're, what we're getting here. And then I have a little experiment that I thought might be a fun thing for us to um, delve a little further into this. Um, so what we start with here is, is she's, she's getting into the details of every part that goes into a work of fiction. Um, she's, she's laying out, um, all the different parts, plot, theme, plot, characterization, style. She gets into extra detail because, you know, it's that fantastic where she's going to bring in a new concept of plot theme. Um, I'm kind of guessing Rob and Joy are going to delve into that a little bit more. Um, and one of the things that she really comes to multiple times in this chapter is about integration between each of these elements. Um, she starts the first time she's bringing up the integration between the plot and the theme. And then a little while later, she's bringing up integration between plot, theme, and characterization. And then even further, she brings it up between um, all of those three elements and style and how it's important that the more powerful work of art comes with a more integrated uh, of all of these parts together, a more integrated whole. Um, so, oh, where did I try to knock something out? Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to do was to take this discussion where she comes into, specifically, she's coming into um, an issue of style. And I, she's given us two different excerpts. She does them in a specific order. I'm going to reverse that order for what we're talking about. Um, because I think that we can, she's, what she's done here is she's, previously I talked about how she goes from say A to C, but, she, and, but you don't, you, you're not getting everything, but now we're going kind of from A to somewhere further down in the alphabet, but I think there's even a deeper level that we can go. So what I wanted to do was take these two excerpts that um, she has provided in this chapter, and for us to kind of delve into those excerpts in a way to sort of do a, this is gonna sound funny, a group sense of life introspection, which of course you can't do that as a group because you're all in your own heads and we're all in wherever we are around the world. Um, but by doing it sort of together at the same time, maybe we can get a little bit deeper understanding of um, what she's talking about in, in this discussion of style. So I have, um, I, for those of you that know Rob, you probably already know that he, he has many, many voices. 
in his head. Um, <laughs> in my head. <laughs> in your head. Um, <laughs> Um, so I have talked to him several times over this week of uh, how to get, I'm playing director here. I am asked him to read these excerpts in a voice that um, I think is appropriate to the style of each excerpt. So you're going to get a little bit different uh, voice from both of them. I think that adds to it. See, was another level of integration here. Um, method reading. Method reading. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is we're going to, I want you all to, to kind of under, get a, a deeper level of understanding of, um, from someone in the visual arts who spends a lot of time working on how to get from point A to Z and getting everything in between, how to milk the most out of a work of art. I thought this would be a fun way to do it. So as Rob reads these, we're going to read the second excerpt first. I'm just going to have him read it in his, the voice I gave him or he worked on. Um, and if you want, go ahead and shut your eyes, just listen. But what I want you to focus on, not so much, I mean, obviously I want you to listen to what he's saying, but what I really want you to focus on is to turn inward, to look in, look inside, look not actually, but to, to try to watch and, ex, ex, and, and observe what your brain is doing, what your emotions are bringing up. I want you to do a level of introspection while you're reading this to pay attention to the, what your reaction is to the words. Um, and then I'll have them read it a second time and I've got a little Rob pause button here and I'll give you essentially my reaction, my thought process, what my brain is going through, through each of these. And I think this might be a nice way to sort of get us all that extra level of understanding of a work of art, um, teaching us how to uh, look a little bit deeper. So are you ready? Yeah, so just to be clear, these are excerpts from other novels, uh, so, so two excerpts from other novels that Ayn Rand has, uh, contrast experts, excerpts that she has, that she provides as examples. So yeah, so the first one that Rob's going to read, he's going to read it whole the first time, and then the second time I will um, interrupt him, awesome. and this is from Thomas Wolfe's novel, The Web and the Rock. By the way, this is Thomas Wolfe, not Tom Wolfe. Yeah. Um, it'd be a totally different voice if I were doing Tom Wolfe. All right. <laughs> Ready. That hour, that moment, and that place struck with a peerless coincision upon the very heart of his own youth, the crest and zenith of his own desire. The city had never seemed as beautiful as it looked that night. For the first time, he saw that New York was supremely among the cities of the world, the city of the night. There had been achieved here a loveliness that was astounding and incomparable, a kind of modern beauty inherent to its place and time that no other place nor time could match. He realized suddenly that the beauty of other cities of the night, of Paris, spread below one from the butte of Sacré-Cœur in its vast, mysterious blossoms of nocturnal radiance, of London with its smoky nimbus of fogged light, which was so peculiarly thrilling because it was so vast, so lost in the illimitable, had each its special quality so lovely and mysterious, but it yet produced no beauty that could equal this. So if you weren't distracted by Rob's voice, <laughs> did you all have sort of an opportunity there to- That's the voice that this has in my head when I read it, by the way. <laughs> did you all have an opportunity to kind of follow your own thinking process, your own reactions to the piece? Then I'm gonna give you a little um, pause button here. Okay, you wanna do this one again, but with pause, the pause button. Yes, so that this way you can kind of get a, a sense of what my reaction, what my brain is going through. Um, it, uh, this may be more than I really wanted to share with everybody, <laughs> but, um, but no, it's, I think it's a good mm -hmm. illustration of um, how, to, how to introspect on a work of art. Okay. So I've got my, my okay. pause button here. Okay. All right. That hour, that moment, and that place struck with a peerless coincision. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
peerless co-incision. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. <laughs> I actually looked me. this up earlier. <coughs> and when I search peerless co-incision, Paul Cohen incision comes up, which is about a specific type of incision for C-sections. Anyway, I went on and on trying to find peerless co-incisions. I never got past that. Okay, so go on. Upon the very heart of his own youth, the crest and zenith of his own desire. The city had never seemed as beautiful as it looked that night. I think all cities are beautiful at mm -hmm. night. For the first time he saw that New York was supremely among the cities of the world, the city of the night. There had been achieved here a loveliness that was astounding and incomparable. All cities are lovely, but What's lovely about this one in particular? A kind of modern beauty inherent to its place and time that no other place nor time could match. So it's of its place and time and no other place and time. It's telling me that it's of itself and not others. He realized suddenly that the beauty of other cities of the night, of Paris, Whoa, 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 we were just in New York. Why are we in Paris? Spread below one from the butte of Sacre-Cœur in its vast, mysterious blossoms of nocturnal radiance. Blossoms of nocturnal radiance. Huh. Well, that sounds kind of pretty. But wait a minute. Are we in Paris now or are we in New York? Of London with its smoky... Whoa, 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 London? How did we get to London so quickly? Smoky nimbus of fog flight. He's telling me London is foggy. Doesn't everybody know that London is foggy? Which was so peculiarly thrilling because it was so vast, so lost in the illimitable. God, this guy really likes hearing himself talk. Had each its special quality so lovely and mysterious, yet had produced no beauty that could equal this. So in the end, I've not learned anything. I've been to three cities <laughs> and I've not learned anything. <laughs> so when I hear this, I feel like there's a part of me as an architect that is filling in the blanks. I'm picturing individual cities. I'm certainly bringing in what I love about each city, but I'm not, I'm not in any of those cities. It's like I'm looking at postcards and somebody's handing me postcards, or it's like I'm remembering little snippets of things here and there, but nothing's really, I, I'm not going anywhere. It's just like kind of the random thoughts while I'm out mowing the lawn, maybe, you know what I mean? It's just, there's no train of thought that's happening. I'm just kind of floating over here and then suddenly floating to a different city and back and forth. By the way, the key to reading this as, as my approach was to spend extra loving time on each of the big words. Illimitable, peerless coincision. Still confusing. Astounding and incomparable. <laughs> you have to just love saying the words. So much so I can't get them to stop now. Yes, <laughs> so um, now I'm going to have you read the first excerpt. You ready? All right. So this, again, everybody. I want you to pay attention to what is happening, how your brain is reacting, what emotions are coming up when you're hearing this. Ready? Nobody ever walked across the bridge, not on a night like this. The rain was misty enough to be almost fog-like, a cold gray curtain that separated me from the pale ovals of white that were faces locked behind the seamed up windows of the cars that hissed by. Even the brilliance that was Manhattan by night was reduced to a few sleepy yellow lights off in the distance. Some place over there had left my car and started walking, burying my head in the collar of my raincoat with the night pulled in around me like a blanket. I walked and I smoked and I flipped the spent butts ahead of me and watched them arch to the pavement and fizzle out with one last wink. Very different piece, right? You ready? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna give him on, uh, him on my pause button. Nobody ever walked across the bridge, not on a night like this. 
I'm instantly on a specific bridge, um, not quite a real bridge, but kind of a conglomeration of specific bridges because he's telling me not on a night like this. And so my brain is suddenly imagining what kinds of weather would put me in a situation where you just wouldn't walk across such a bridge. The rain was misty enough to be almost fog-like, a cold gray curtain that separated me from the pale ovals of white that were faces locked behind the steamed up windows of the cars that hissed by. Now, that was just a sentence. And in that period of that sentence, my mind has conjured up this image of a dark night with this foggy mist that I can almost feel on my face. And the sound of cars, no, it's a bridge. So it seems I hear that sound of cars going over a bridge that has almost like a hollow sound than it, than it does a car going on a regular road. Um, I have this sense that beyond the edge of the bridge, there is just emptiness and this very distinct sound of car tires driving on wet pavement that makes that hiss splashy kind of sound that you all probably know. Go ahead. Even the brilliance that was Manhattan by night was reduced to a few sleepy yellow lights off of the distance. And then suddenly my brain has filled in a far distant scene of, in this case, my brain is thinking, New, well, Manhattan, he does say Manhattan, doesn't right. he? Yeah, so I'm thinking of that way that city lights look when there's such a dense fog that they look almost like the way a light will look from a lighthouse deep out in the fog where it's just this pale little glow of a like an orb of light. So in the space of those, is it two or three sentences? My brain has created this entire almost movie set and I am there and my feet are on the ground and I can feel that rain. Go on. Some place over there I had left my car and started walking, burying my head in the collar of my raincoat with the night pulled in around me like a blanket. And with that line, I feel this length of the walk that's ahead of me. And I feel that snugness of the night sky like a blanket. It feels like a blanket pulling around and it makes that vastness off the either side of the bridge, it makes it feel physically like I can actually feel it. I walked and I smoked and I flipped the spent butts ahead of me and watched them arch to the pavement and fizzle out with one last wink. And here I can almost smell the cigarette smell, which frankly, I hate. But in this point, I, it's, that doesn't, the smell doesn't bother me. What I see is I see these, this cigarette butt flying out and I can visualize the exact arc that it makes. And even hear that as the cigarette, as that last bit of fire hits the wetness and dissolves and goes away. So for me, one of these left me sort of drifting around, not sure, not able to put pieces together. The other essentially created a movie like five senses activated real place. So I'm curious later on in the Q&A if you guys have any input to put to that of what your reactions were. But that is a way that I like to um, use when you're looking at all arts. I know it's literature, <laughs> but all of the arts, you have this kind of sense of life introspection that you're capable of doing, of observing what your reaction is, and then listening and thinking about that reaction to get an even greater depth of value out of the work of art. Wow. 
That was amazing. That was amazing. Thank you. You guys make a good team, you know. Well, by the way, I'm going to say <laughs> with, with, with the reading of this one, because I'm a big Mickey Splain fan from way back. So I've got my camera in my head here. I've actually got Stacey Keach as my camera because he, he did it on television for a while in the 80s. Uh, and he was he was a great my camera. Uh, but this, there's a rhythm to Splain's writing. And it's this very American style of writing. Uh, and I think it's interesting that Ayn Rand loved that so much because it's a very American because it's very clipped and direct. And especially comes out where he says, I, I walked and I smoked and I flipped. And there's a bump, yeah, there's a, a bump, bump, a bump. There's a rhythm to it. It's and very... you know that bump, 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 <laughs> bump, now that you just said that, yeah. you know what that reminds me of? What? It's the cars going on oh, yeah, the yeah, wheels yeah, yeah. on the bridge where they go across the seams, but you just like that. Yeah. yeah. So now you just added another layer to there it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Joya, you're next. This is fantastic. And I'm so glad you started this way. This is absolutely how I wanted to start too, by actually delving into the very specific examples. Uh, yeah. Because in this, this chapter, she's going to give us very broad principles of literature. But, but my contention is we really have to start with the concretes first. And so this is absolutely where I wanted to start. And this is so fascinating because as you describe your reaction, my way of reading this is so different from yours. So it's so illuminating to me. And, and I totally see how Sherry is this architect and so visual and she has all of these, these beautiful visual images that go for her. And my way of reading this is so completely different. So first I even wanted to pick up about this whole idea about peerless coincision and how I read this. So this first line, if you notice how it starts, it starts with that hour, that moment, and that place struck. So we have these three things, the hour, the moment, the place, and they strike. And we're going to see in the rest of the sentence, they're going to strike upon his heart. And this is the coincision because there's an, an incision. The striking is an incision, but it's three things all at the same time. So it's a coincision. And then he wants to, to tell us that the way that these three things uh, coincided or, or struck at the same time was unlike anything else. So it was peerless. And when I read this, one of the first things that, that jumps to my mind is my very writerly brain says that if you just said these three things strike upon my heart, strike upon my heart is one of those phrases, it's almost kind of ho-hum drum. It's a metaphor we've heard many, many times. You know, things strike our heart. And, and that, that's very common English phrase and analogy. But when we actually use a phrase like coincision, that makes it more interesting. It makes it more interesting in terms of the English vocabulary. We're, we're in introducing new words. So we're going beyond just a, a typical phrase. And, and, and there's, there's a sense that, you know, when, when we repeat some of these, uh, you could almost call them dead images, you know, strike upon my heart. We've heard it so many times that we almost miss the, the effect of that, that strike, that word, because we've just heard that phrase strike my heart so many times, but the coincision precisely because it's a different kind of word, it strikes us, you could say, in a very different way. And then to match that with a word like peerless. So for my literary mind, I love how we're, we're playing with this, this fun and different kinds of vocabulary. And then in the first excerpt, and I will want to say that, that I did find, uh, I was distracted by Rob's reading, but that's, I think, just because I have a certain voice that I hear in my head. And this first excerpt to me is Humphrey Bogart. When I read the, the Mickey Spillane, I hear it as, as Humphrey Bogart. So anything that's not that already starts to be a little distracting. But with this too, I definitely get into the rhythm for sure. This is the other part of the linguistic and the language effect of it is precisely the language, the rhythm of the language. So you pointed out the I walked and I smoked and I flipped. And the part of it that I love is the way this sentence ends and the way I hear it, which is that um, it arched to the pavement and fizzle out with one last wink. And every time I read it, there is that slowing down that, that is there in the vocabulary. 
this is almost a, a well-known poetic effect. You find this in a lot of examples of poetry. When you really want to emphasize a certain phrase or sentence, you incorporate these one-syllable words because just the way that English is set up, when we have words that have multiple syllables like fizzle, we put the emphasis on one syllable, the first syllable, as opposed to the second one. Where, where as opposed to when we get this ending where we just have the single syllable words. It makes the line slow down because each word gets emphasized in a way that, that just isn't there when you have words with more than one syllable. And I love the beauty of that because I get so focused in on the language and the language effect and the rhythm of the language and then how the rhythm of the language is mimicking what you would be seeing as this, this cigarette butt arches and then slowly fizzles out. So, but I, but I find it so fascinating how my, my way of reading goes immediately to the words and the play of the words and the rhythm of the words. And though I definitely do get some of the imagery. So, so I'm, I'm totally following along with Sherry that, you know, I'm definitely getting images of New York skyscrapers and the Sacre Coeur in Paris and, and a vision of London that for me, just maybe this even gets to my cognition. We, we've been talking in these, these sessions about art and cognition that so much of my cognition is very much keyed in more on both the play of the meaning of the words, that linguistic play, and then also what you might call the poetic rhythm of the language is, is what I'm totally focused in on. So I love that we started here. And then I just wanted to make a, a, a broader point to, to connect this with the, the overarching theme of this whole chapter where Ayn Rand analyzes literature into four parts. Uh, as Sherry pointed out, we're going to talk about plot, theme, characters, and style. And one of the things I wanted to say at the outset was just a way that I've seen people go wrong with this chapter. So I wanted to just sort of put it out there as a kind of warning that I hope we, we will not fall into is to, to, to take these parts and use them as a, as a starting place. And I want to say that I don't think that's the right way to look at this analysis, that this isn't a recipe. This isn't that we have sort of four parts of plot, theme, character, style, and we're going to put those all together and you know, bake them in the oven and out of it, we're going to get a novel. That this analysis of plot and theme and character and style, that it, it really, I think, comes after, that we do have to start with these concrete examples. And so I love that Shikant asked people to put their favorite novels and works of literature in the list, because I do think this is where we want to start. We want to start with the whole. And, and Sherry is pointing out that integration comes up in, in this chapter. And, and we've seen that word come up a lot, even in the, the previous chapters as we've been building up here. But now I think it really is all coming together. And we want to start with the full integration. We want to start with the works themselves as a whole. And then I think once we have that whole, it can be really insightful and instructive to take these four principles, and the principles I think are even just a starting place as we've already seen in this analysis, to think about how we analyze the literature. And as we both analyze the literature itself and our reactions to the literature, that we get so much more out of the experience of the literature or of any work of art by going through this analysis. And then I wanted to end by bringing up a question that Jonathan in our discussion brought up to me. And I'm going to give a little plug. So I don't know if some of you guys saw, but on the meetup page, Jonathan had put out um, to see if anybody might be interested in going into further depth with some of the earlier chapters that we had discussed. And he started putting together a great list of questions. And so he and I and Ash kind of jumped on a call earlier to go into some further depth with, because there is just so much richness in these chapters that we only even just scratch the surface, even though we've spent so many hours already going through this. So if anyone is interested in going in, even greater depth. I think we're going to do it again next week, uh, the hour before this discussion starts. And Jonathan had started a Google Doc. So if you have other questions, even from the earlier chapters that you wanted us to explore. 
But I wanted to bring up one that he had put out that I think even ties in perfectly with, with what we're talking about here, because it's all about analyzing, in this case, literature, and then also analyzing your reaction to it. And he brought up this really great quote that, that Ayn Rand had had in one of the earlier chapters. And he, he asked this question. He asked, has anyone had the experience of viewing art where, as Ayn Rand says, quote, the pleasure of the con contemplation is so intense so deeply personal that a man experiences it as a self-sufficient and self-justifying primary and often resists or resents any suggestion to analyze it. The suggestion to him has a quality of an attack on his identity, on his deepest essential self. And that to me is really interesting because it's the exact opposite of my own approach. I absolutely love to analyze literature. As Srikant mentioned, I spent many years in grad school where all we did was analyze literature and analyze our responses to literature or you could say art broadly. And to me, there's so much value in this analysis. So I have the exact opposite uh, approach. But I'd love to hear if anybody on the call would like to share what they think about this, this approach to being very analytical about artworks, literature specifically, or art broadly. Uh, do you find that you resent uh, the suggestion to analyze it? Or what kinds of value do you get from the analysis? So that's what I'd love to put on the table today. Oh, wonderful. And uh... So Joya, uh, Jonathan, and Ash, I love this idea about uh, diving in deep. What we will do is that we'll do, how about doing this one hour, you know, basically immediately after the meetup ends. So it doesn't conflict with anything. And anybody else who wants to continue on and join, or just listen in or contribute can do that. Fair enough? Okay, perfect. All right, next up is Rob. Okay, well, I'm going to start by answering Joya's question right off the bat, which is I have never resented or resisted the suggestion to analyze anything. <laughs> so, so I'm more like you that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and also, I'm going to say I take requests, so I'm going to work on my Humphrey Bogart impression, and next time I'll read that was bogey. Uh, <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> Now I can see I, you know, I've, got, I've, got, I've got Stacey Keach in my head because I saw my camera on the TV in the 80s and that he was my camera. He was a great my camera. But yeah, it's definitely the, it's that hard boiled detective fiction style. Mm -hmm. And actually, I want to say something briefly about that before I get to the main thing, which is that I find it somewhat fascinating since this is where she talks a lot about literary style. Um, I find it fascinating that she admires that style so much from uh, from Mickey Splain. Uh, I think she also gets a little bit of it from, I'm guessing she gets a little bit of it from Sinclair Lewis because she, she criticized him on, on the naturalism of his work, but she clearly admires him as a writer. And uh, also sort of from the hard boiled detective fiction of the twenties and thirties. And it's a very American style. And what I find fascinating is she has a huge admiration for Victor Hugo. She talks a lot about Victor Hugo. In terms of actual nuts and bolts of writing style, this is really opposite of Victor Hugo in a lot of ways. He's very 19th century. He's more ornate, more complicated sentence structure, uh, bigger words, and you know, uh, more likely to use words like peerless coincision or something like that. Uh, so, you know, she she admires Victor Hugo for his characterization, for his plot structure, especially uh, for for the romanticism of, of of his work. But it's interesting that she takes that. It's like she takes Victor Hugo's plot approach to plot. And characterization and the way he builds up a conflict, she takes that and then gives it this American, very direct, uh, direct, short, declarative sentence kind of approach. Um, I had an editor very early on. This is you know at a financial publication. I had an editor whose mantra was short Anglo-Saxon words. Right, so <laughs> you know, short words with Anglo-Saxon roots. Use those. That's the style, and uh, you know that that is the. It's like a direct a very clear and direct style that just goes straight into someone's brain with information and isn't messing around. Cause he had a bunch of, they had an odd thing. It's how I, how I ended up working for a financial publication is he said, we hire people who know how to write and then we teach them about finance cause we find we can't do it the other way around. <laughs> right. And, uh, but you know, he had a bunch of these humanities space, he had a bunch of humanities majors there. So he had to do this thing of like short Anglo-Saxon words. Now was not the time for your big Latin derived uh, long words to use, you know, short Anglo-Saxon words, it penetrates straight into people's brains. It's simple, it's direct, it's very easy to process. So I find it fascinating that she took that very American 
fact-based, matter-of-fact, unpretentious style, and then turned it into, and then and incorporated it into the romantic fiction, the approach to romantic fiction that she borrowed from Victor Hugo, which had a much more flowery or ornate style of writing. Um, and I, I've something I briefly want to say at the end, I'm not going to do it now, but uh, I think we all have an assignment to go home and uh, consume some Victor Hugo because it's going to help us out. I've got some suggestions on that. Uh, but the thing I really wanted to talk about this one was plot because it's it fast. What she says about plot really fascinates me because I think it's not very well understood. Now, my big question I'm going to leave today, and I'll repeat it at the end, but it's mostly for Joya because I have not really studied literature in a formal way. I don't know what all the other theories of literature are. I have a, my impression is a lot of what Ayn Rand says here about plot is not really so much new and unique to her. So some of the things about you know the, 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 the plot, the idea of a plot building up to a climax and having a resolution, and then the, you know the, the the large resolution that follows from that, this is not you know she didn't invent all this stuff. This is pretty standard stuff. So my curious question is, what exactly is unique to her in, to, in her analysis here, especially about the issue of plot? So I'm going to leave that as an open question. But the one thing I can see that is not well understood is this idea of plot not just as a series of events but as a series of connected events that build together in order, to, um, uh, in order to sort of sum up all the events in one key uh, uh, climax. Uh, and I would notice that specifically in regard to, um, there's a, a TV series that's uh, gotten a lot of popular, popularity right now. Sherry and I have been watching it because a lot of people you know, said, that, you know, said good things about it. So I said, I should check it out called uh, it's called The Queen's Gambit. It's, at Netflix, it's a Netflix series. Has anybody seen it? Okay, mm -hmm. a couple of hands up. And the thing that fascinates me was I, we got about, we're about in the fifth episode, middle of the fifth episode now. And it struck me that I'm not really sure it has a plot, <laughs> right? And so it has these very interesting events and they're just interesting characters. And I really like the, uh, the lead actress has a lot of charisma, but I'm sort of watching it and realizing that I'm still, you know, we're almost five, we're in the middle of the fifth episode. And I'm still sort of thinking, oh, this is an intriguing setup. When is the plot going to begin? And it's not that there aren't, and I, I mentioned this online and, and somebody was like, well, how can you say there's no plot? There's all these very dramatic events that have happened. And the interesting thing is you get a lot of events in there that are very dramatic and they'd be very dramatic to you if they happened in your own life. So the, for those who haven't seen it, the series is about- Don't spoil uh, it, No, I'm not. The series about a female chess prodigy in the 1960s. And so, you know, these very, these very dramatic events, like she, you know, goes off to a big chess tournament and wins, wins the tournament, wins, you know, has this kind of, has this big match against the, the top player and wins the tournament. It's a very dramatic event that happened to you in your own life, but it seemed curiously undramatic in the context of this series. And I was wondering why, and I think it's that they present a lot of very big events that happen, but they're not summing up something that came before. They're not connecting together and they're not sort of building up to a climax where something is resolved. It's just, you know, it's like event, a dramatic event happens and the characters all just sort of move on and another thing happens and the characters all sort of move on and you never get a sense that these things are adding up and building and then they're eventually adding up and building to something where a decision is made and uh, uh, some big question is resolved. I think I'm, the reason I've been watching it so for, so long is because there's lots of interesting issues being raised, interesting conflicts that could potentially be resolved, but none of them are being built up into a spot where they have to be resolved. Now, maybe somebody will argue against me and say, I'm all wrong, I'm, I'm missing the plot. Uh, but it, it, what it struck me as interesting is this idea of a plot, not simply as a chronicle of events, even as a chronicle of interesting and dramatic events. So what this reminds me of a little bit is uh, Ayn Rand talks a lot about Sinclair Lewis in here. And my one big encounter with Sinclair Lewis a number of years ago for, I think for one of your architecture grad school classes, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the professor had you read, uh, had you read, uh, no, it wasn't oh, architecture, it, it was uh, Main Street, exactly. Main Street by Sinclair yeah. Lewis. Yeah. And it's basically this ordinary person, you know, the chronicle of life of this ordinary person goes through a bunch of ordinary middle-class events in a middle-class town and it's just one event thing happens after another and then nothing builds up and nothing happens and there's no big conflict. And it's, it's absolutely the absolute soul of naturalism in writing. 
where it's a chronicle of events, but there's no real buildup where some big key event happens. Now, there are naturalist, I think there are naturalist books or stories in which there is a plot structure. This one did not have it. It's just a number of events. And you know, there are things, again, would be important events in your own life if they happen to you, like getting married or having a child. But in the book, they just sort of, one happens and all the characters move on and another thing happens and nothing builds up. And this reminds me, this, 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 the Queen's Gambit, the show, reminds me a little bit of that, like that, except it's not with like the person next door, not with an ordinary, totally ordinary person, but with an unusual person, right? A person with some unusual skills who has unusual experiences in life. But the same sort of patterns, that's sort of what makes you think, oh, something big and important is gonna happen. But the pattern is very similar that a, an event happens, that would be a big event that happened in your life, but it doesn't add up to the other events and it's that way of adding events up. And now at the same time, we've been watching, um, we just a couple of days ago watched the 2012 movie version of the musical of Les Miserables. And it's an interesting contrast there because you know that the, the Les Miserables packs so much is going on, you know, in, in so little space all throughout, you know, one thing after another, it's constantly building you up, building events up to a big climax and having a big uh, event and then building you another even bigger climax and they're building it all up to one big event. And so it's interesting to see that contrast between how a plot works as something that doesn't just a chronicle of events, but is building the events up into some big climax where things are decided. And then it struck me the last part about that is she talks, and this is the important part about it, she talks about how these aspects of a novel are we can separate them out for purposes of study, but they're really all going together. And what it strikes me is how the how a plot here, the idea of a plot structure, connects to this issue of choice, which is going to be central to her theory of literature. She's going to get more into that in the next couple chapters. But how the idea of events building up to a point where somebody makes a choice that then resolves the events, how that's essential for the existence of the plot and also how it's essential for characterization too, that in order to reach that, you know, the, the in this, the Queen's Gambit, the, the fact the plotlessness also leads to sort of an, an emptiness of the character. You don't really get a sense of the internal life I'm finding. I don't get a sense for the internal life of this character because we're not building up to the point where the character then has to make choices and has to make choices that will really resolve big issues. And without that, you don't. You only get to a certain level on the characterization. You can't get beneath that. So I think it's interesting how that shows how plot and characterization sort of integrate together, and they're two inseparable things. That you, you know, the plot is your means of characterization, and your characterization is your means to the plot. Um, so I think to end on something to joy, reiterating re something Joya said that. You know, we don't look at this as a recipe. I think we need sort of a Ninth Amendment approach to this. You know, the, so the Ninth Amendment in the, in the Bill of Rights says, you know, the listing, the enumeration of various rights in the, you know, in, in the other amendments does not mean, does not deny or disparage that there are other rights that you possess, right? So it's the idea that this is open-ended, that because we've listed some things, it doesn't mean that there isn't more. And well, I well, think- well, This is about art, not politics. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I had to bring politics in somewhere, but, uh, uh, I think we need a similar approach to interpreting, you know, to always keep that in the back of our mind here that uh, everything in here, there she says, oh, well, there's this aspect and there's this aspect does not mean there isn't a lot more because, you know, she's, she's going in greater depth here than she has before, but the, even this whole book is, is not very long and is, is, is just sort of going in, you know, there's a lot, there's a whole ocean of, of other observations to make. Right. Um, that, that was great. And I, what I want to do is I want to focus on plot a little bit more mm -hmm. because I think that is the most fascinating, just, just like Rob, I, I was really taken with that. And what I want to do is I want to connect that with music, um, especially Beethoven's music, because it's the question of will, you know, and the conflict that, you know, that actually is the issue here. Uh, what plot a good plot you know, sets up a conflict that gets resolved ultimately. So let me talk about this through the, by, by parallel with Fifth Symphony of Beethoven, okay? So Fifth, the fifth Symphony is in four movements. Okay, so I also, also think of plot like that. Right in the first moment, you have 
ba 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 pam it's basically a statement of will that i will do that okay i will do that okay it is and it's a very strong positive statement okay and that's what the first movement is about and that's really the theme that there is a act of will then the second movement actually shows all kinds of problems that come that has to be that have to be overcome so it delineates all the things that you have to struggle with so that's the second movement if you look at the third movement it is actually that will trying to solve those problems you know going around a particular line and then kind of not making it you know trying again and failing again so there is this attempt of resolution and the fourth movement is this triumphant resolution and victory over that so that and that actually it it was you know it is beethoven's brilliance to bring that into music because music if you look at music before that it was basically a core theme and then expansion on the theme that is the structure whereas somehow beethoven managed to bring this plot element in that and it is not you know it is definitely because of the fact that he brings volition into music in in the romantic sense um so i think i i think that's very interesting and and plot me i love victor hugo and if you want to see an example of a plot i think victor hugo is it because what happens in victor hugo is that there is a conflict and as it is being resolved a even bigger conflict comes out of that and as that is about to be resolved another bigger conflict comes and each of the conflict happens in unpredictable direction that you had not thought of before and then once you see it you can see oh of course you know that was there before so it's kind of like this unfolding of conflicts a deeper and deeper deeper conflicts um and resolving all of them and the structure to do that um and i think einran has done a brilliant job of kind of explicating all of that but in terms of pulling it off i strongly recommend uh, victor hugo for that um so now uh, what i want to do is um let us have the um let us um let us have the panelist put a question on the table joya you had a question i don't know whether it was fully answered yeah i'll i'll just repeat my my question for the group and it it was about this idea of of analyzing literature and and it was this quote from Ayn Rand earlier in the book where she says um uh the pleasure of that contemplation is so intense so deeply personal that a man experiences it as a self-sufficient self-justifying primary and often resists or resents any suggestion to analyze it and so that that is the question has anybody experienced that uh resistance or resentment to analyze it Rob says no uh Sherry yeah um th- this is um rob was just whispering in my ear um i don't now no i but i can really understand a sense of not wanting someone else to poke holes in mm-hmm. your view of a work of art so i i am for for a very long time when i have discovered a work of art that's deeply personal to me I really don't talk about it at first um until I've had the time to really dig deep and to to feel really comfortable with it and and the reason is because um I don't like um it it, it feels like an attack if somebody is poking holes as it were in this this new relationship almost that I've discovered mm-hmm. you know it's like it's like when you're in a relationship and there's that early point when you don't want to tell anybody about it because you're just still exploring and you're you know it's kind of like that so i don't have a reaction to i i don't i i don't i i don't have a problem fully exploring it in fact I, I, that's what i love the most about it but i totally understand that sense of not wanting it to be destroyed by someone else. The funny thing that Rob was whispering in my ear was before we started dating, 
um, we went to a movie. Um, with mutual friends. With mutual friends. Um, and the side part here that you will all find extremely funny is we go to a movie and Rob pulls out, I believe it was Kant, wasn't it? <laughs> Critique of Pure Reason. <laughs> Critique of Pure Reason. Which, which I was reading. Who was brings reading. this to the movie theater? In my mind, I'm thinking, how are you going to read during the movie? <laughs> it's kind of dark in a theater. And I asked him, why, what are you doing? We're going to a movie and you're bringing Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And he says, oh, in case I get bored during the movie. Sure enough, he did pull it out. It was not a very good movie. <laughs> the hilarious thing is just last week, our 13 year old, we, we were watching a movie, this obviously not in the theaters, and our 13 year old pulls out a book. I looked at Rob and just started shaking my head. But anyway, the side part is, we that was just a little side part. Yeah. Um, what happened is um, I grew up in a situation where you go to a movie, you go see a performance, you leave, it's very Minnesotan, very reserved, like, yep, that was nice. And you went on off to dinner. There was no discussion. Um, we watched this movie and even though Rob was reading <laughs> philosophy during the middle of it, we left the movie theater and our group of friends started a discussion about the movie that lasted longer than the movie <laughs> itself. <laughs> and all the while, the first 15 <laughs> minutes of it, I was thinking, what, did you like it or not? There's nothing else to discuss, then we're done. And then, I don't know, maybe about 45 minutes in, I was thoroughly entranced by, oh, it's like I didn't even see the movie. I wanted to go back and watch it again. And by hour three, the movie was only two hours long. Um, I was hooked. Um, so I don't, I don't ever not do that. It was Mel Gibson's Hamlet, by the way. There was a so, lot to talk about. Yeah, well, good and bad. Yeah. Good and bad. <laughs> How about uh, you, Shrikan? Um, let me see. I, I, I want to, I want to raise one more question. I'm okay. trying to cover as much as much as much crowd. No, for for me, it's like, um, you know. Uh, so it's art is very personal. I think that that is very big. So something like music, right? It is very difficult to kind of convert that into words and talk to people about it. Um, so that is that is the hardest part. Literature, I think, is relatively easy because it is already in conceptual, you know, kind of explicit conceptual form. So it is easier for me. But music, it is a lot harder. And you can kind of talk use some terms, but the other person has to have enough kind of understanding of music to be able to figure out what is being referred to. And if they don't, it is very hard to actually talk about, about those things. Um, so the question I had was about the in, kind of this relationship between theme and plot. So what is it, you know, what is it about a plot? When you say that a plot does a good job of illustrating a theme. What does that mean? Well, what's, when, what is a proper plot for a theme? What is the relationship between theme and plot for anybody? Rob, Sherry? Oh, I'll, I'll jump in and say something here. Yep. So I, I even just wanna tie this back to what you were saying about, about Beethoven and emphasizing the conflict, because to me, I think that really is the, the key point to stress. So this is something that's really interesting to me personally, because so for all the years that I spent studying literature, the way that academia divides up its disciplines, uh, you, you study literature by specializing in certain time periods. So I specialized in the 18th century time period, which is very fascinating because I got to do a really deep dive into the beginning of the novel and what is a novel and what distinguishes a novel from a romance and perhaps all the other genres of, of literature that came before. But in all the work that I did, there really wasn't that much discussion of plot, not, not, in, not in this way. And, and to a certain extent, that might just be because I think even these developments in plot were really more of a late 19th century phenomenon. Uh, when we're thinking about Hugo, Dostoevsky, and, and even Beethoven, this is really a sort of a, a 19th century or you know, second half later 19th century phenomenon. So I just personally never got to explore that. But I think Ayn Rand really is getting at something unique by connecting 
both the concept of a plot that focuses on conflict and then connecting that with a really broad philosophical abstraction. This idea she has of plot theme, I think is very unique to her. And it illuminates, I think, her approach to how she created literature. And I think it can be a really useful tool in, in our toolbox as we think about the, the value we can get from art to have both a concrete that builds up to a really strong conflict and then also connects that to a wider philosophical theme. And I would say, I love how um, Rob even contrasted this with the Queen's Gambit. So I wanna even say something about the Queen's Gambit. So anybody who maybe didn't see this and doesn't wanna hear, this is your spoiler alert. You can uh, shut this down now for the next couple minute or two. But I did wanna say, I think this is a really great example because it's, it's an interesting contrast because there is a real way in which that story is building up to something because we're building up. So it, it's a story about this chess prodigy and she's going through successive levels of contest and competition and she's eventually going to become the world champion. So there's your spoiler alert. But the, the point to connect us with this idea of plot is there really isn't any sense of real conflict. Like we, we see the trajectory of where this story is going. It's, it's building up, but there is real, no, no, no conflict in that story. It's just, she is going through successive levels to eventually become the world chess champion. And, and to Rob's point, there is an interesting way in which we, we really don't get to know too much about this character. We see one interesting aspect of her that of what che what function chess is serving in her life. That that she starts out she's she's this orphan and and she's kind of using chess as a way to perhaps uh, you know get through some of the difficulties of her childhood. But then the chess perhaps itself is becoming this obsession, and we're kind of seeing the way that the obsession with chess plays in with uh, uh, an addiction to drugs. And, and there's this whole question of, is she able to build relationships and, and what function is chess serving for her? But one of the things that I noticed in this interesting move that was interesting about this, this show is at the end, a lot of viewers had a real question about how the movie ends. So again, spoiler alert, the movie ends that she wins the big uh, competition, which is in Moscow. And in the very last scene, we see that she's going out to a park where just a lot of people love to play chess and she's playing chess with a bunch of, of old men. And, and we were getting the sense that she's maybe finding a new way to enjoy chess, perhaps for the first time, because it's not just a, a competition, but she's just able to play perhaps for the fun of it. But a lot of viewers who saw this whole show were questioning like, well, does this mean that she's going to try to stay in Moscow now? Or And it raises this point that we really don't know because we haven't really gotten that in-depth sense of her to be able to answer that question in terms of the choice that she would make. So so to see plot as going beyond just a, a buildup of, of events, but to be about something that is about conflict and choice and then connecting it with abstract themes, I think that really is the power that we're getting from Ayn Rand's analysis here. Right. Um Robert Sherry, do would, do you want to put a question on the table? I, I want to answer a little something on the question. Your, what you said about plot and theme, and then just very briefly, I sure. want it, and then put a question out that I really would like to know. Um, and that I think Aunt Joy has partly answered it, but I want to maybe give her a chance to say more about it. Uh, but first, I want to say about plot and theme. One thing that struck me about this chapter when I was reading it is its usefulness to a nonfiction writer. Uh, mm. So, as a nonfiction writer, uh, I actually use something uh, an equivalent of each of these things because so for example obviously when i'm writing a, you know i'm writing a nonfiction piece i have a theme so i have a, a message an idea uh uh that i want to convey and it might be you know this executive order that you know has been proposed as a bad idea all right so i have an idea right, I, I, i'll be more specific about why it's a bad idea but i've got a theme an abstract theme but because i'm writing about the news and i think it'd be true of any nonfiction writing that theme is also expressed in terms of a, a series of things that have happened or things people have said, right? That are, that are illustrating that theme, that are supporting my argument. So I do create something that's sort of like a plot theme. That is a, it's not exactly the same thing as a plot because it's not one person going through a series of actions, you know, connected actions chronologically. It's a series of 
events, actions, examples, statements that support the argument and support them in a certain order, right? So that takes the reader through a kind of a story, right? You know, a story, you're beginning, a beginning and end to the end of the argument that will answer the reader's question, you know, raise a question and then answer it, then raise another question and answer it and bring the readers in a connected way through to the end of the, of, to the, to the argument, to where they hopefully will agree with my argument. But I think it's interesting that I think in terms, uh, now when I think about it, I think in terms of plot themes, so to speak, in my writing, that I have a theme, an abstract idea I want to convey, but that's connected to here are the, uh, real, the, the events, the actions, the statements that are the means by which I've expressed, the, the theme is expressed. So uh, I, I find that very illuminating. Um, and let, let, let me comment on that. I, you know, I also, you know, for, for my writing also, I do exactly that because this is actually a very general point about how human mind works. I mean, the way I think about it is that there's always a theme that you're trying to write, but then you have to choose where to begin to kind of capture the interest. It is kind of like creating, you know, this uh, Beethoven's notes, you know, you say that's why people will read it. You know, you have to kind of say something in the beginning to say, this is what I'm going to solve, or this is the problem. And it's equivalent. And then it has to end somewhere. So I do beginning and then the end of saying, okay, what would kind of resolve this? And what is the right end piece? And then there is stuff in the middle that will get you from here to there. So that, that's how I think about it. Go ahead, Rob. Well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And it, What's I, your question? But, uh, oh, the question though, what I was going to ask is, to what extent is Ayn Rand's uh, analysis of plot unique to her? Do what? What did she do that went beyond or was different from what has generally been said before about plot? Julia. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say, I th I really think it is this idea of the plot theme, which I haven't heard anywhere else, um, and specifically this 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 really heightened sense of the plot as focusing on choice and conflict and then matching that with something abstract. I'm curious to hear if Sherry does anything interesting with architecture. Is there like a like a structure theme or something in, in architecture? Structure means something different yeah. in architecture. So, or, well, something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, she brings up in, in this chapter, she brings a couple times, she brings up form follows function, which is uh, Sullivan's um, idea. And we've actually done a couple of things all about Sullivan. Um, and there is that there, there's, and it's kind of interesting that she's breaking this down to plot, theme, characterization and style. Architecture is traditionally broken down into three structure, for, function and ornamentation. Um, and uh, I've written about that in a couple of different ways. It kind of goes back to the ancient Greeks and the, and the ancient uh, Romans. I mean, um, but, but there is that kind of, um, what she's doing is she's connecting these, instead of saying, like you had mentioned earlier, these are, these are uh, several different elements that helps to separate them for ease of analysis and you know, just to let's look at it from this perspective, that kind of approach. But the fact is that they aren't really separated. And um, in architecture, the same thing. They aren't, in the best architecture, they aren't really separated because every element, even the structural element, has, it, it has the ability to, uh, to, to reflect a sense of life, even in the parts that you can't see the structural beams and girders that are inside of a skyscraper, the, sh the pattern and the shaping of that still reflects something. So- Can I ask you a question actually? Yeah. The, the, what you didn't mention is there's something, a term, the program, which maybe yeah, you should explain That's that. okay, so- Would that serve something in the same role to a plot? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So in, in architecture, um, one of the, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a, a, an early step in pre-design where you do what's called a program, which I always thought was kind of a weird word because my brain kept thinking computer program. <laughs> oh, but what you're doing is you're gathering information. You're gathering all of the needs of the site and the needs of the project, 
uh, the budget. There's it's a, it's what essentially a, needed. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a brain download, really. Um, but um, you have to, as an architect, you have to sort that out to the point that you can design within that. So that's almost your framework of what you need to create. Um, so I guess in a way that would be like a plot, but yeah. it's a little strained yeah. with an algae. Okay, it's a little strained. Um, <coughs> but what I wanted to ask, um, my question was, uh, as you could tell, as Joya mentioned, I love that we bounced off of each other like that early on. Um, my reaction to fiction has always been um, from my youngest days of remembering even little children's books. Um, I always had that situation where um, I was interested in literature that I had that reaction where a world would form as I was reading and always disliked some points to heavily disliked things that didn't create that for me. Um, but then I married a writer <laughs> and, uh, and I learned through uh, repeated exposure <laughs> that um, like Joy was mentioning this pattern and poetry. So poetry has become something very interesting to me because of the sounds of the words and the play of the pattern of the words, which in many ways reminds me of sculpture, which is that seems strange. But like, if you look at uh, maybe like the Winged Victory, she's on the cover of the newer version of this book. Um, the the texture of the layers of the folds of her drapery, um, there's a pattern and a rhythm to that, and you'll get that pattern and rhythm, and then it does what you had mentioned, Joya, where it will slow down and that contrast catches your attention in, in sculpture the same way it does in literature. And the same thing happens in architecture. And we talked about this and we looked at Linda Mann's paintings. It's when you've got that pattern that develops and then you change it, that contrast draws your attention to focus on that. So my question to all of you is, do you have, I mean, Joy, I think it's kind of answered already that for her, it's about that play of the sound of the words or the meaning <laughs> of the words. Um, do you, Rob or Srikant, or maybe Joy has got more to add and then others can add. Do, do, for you, does, does reading literature make that movie set in your mind or is it very different and does that then affect the type of art that you are drawn to well my answer to that is i do now <laughs> <laughs> uh, no though actually though i think this is also why people uh get so excited when they see a movie adaptation it's always coming out the movie adaptation of their favorite book and it's why we're also disappointed when they mess it up as they do about 80 percent of the time um, because, you know, you, uh, it, literature is a very interesting medium in that you have to, Ayn Rand talked about how art takes it down to a concrete level. Well, literature doesn't exactly take it down to a concrete level. You have to provide all the concrete, you have to provide the full concrete, right? So, uh, literature will give you, uh, the, the, a, a writer works by giving these very specific sort of cues to concretes. Oh, here's it. The figure has to, this is from where? Uh, it's from this chapter. Under characterization. Okay, she says that figure has to be an abstraction yet look like a concrete. Mm -hmm. Well, even a character in, in, a, in a novel, even a well-written novel, is not going to look like a concrete in the full sense. You know, that if you actually look, I've, and I've done this, looking through some of the characters in Ayn Rand's novels or in other novels, and asking, well, what do we really know just from what the author tells us? What do we actually know about the character? And oftentimes it's surprisingly little in terms of physical description. And everything else is filled in by you, the reader. So the, the novelist is always relying on you to fill in the full concrete reality in your own mind of visualizing this character. And usually I do come up with a sense of, oh, here's what, here's what Dagny Taggart would look like, or here's what Jean Valjean would look like, et cetera. Um, and that's why you get so excited when there's an adaptation. You think, oh, yeah, there's somebody who's going to make it fully real on the screen 
which I think is a great opportunity for somebody to do that and make it even more real or bring out something you hadn't even thought of. But it's also an opportunity to mess it up royally, which unfortunately, I think is about an 80-20 rule there that 80% okay. of the time they bring it to, I mentioned in the comments that uh, I just recently read uh, the novel Shane by Jack Schaefer. And it was turned into a Western movie in 1953 with Alan Ladd as the title character, well cast, but I watched the movie recently and I was really disappointed because it's like at every scene, every bit of dialogue, the, the people who are making the movie just didn't understand what the novel was doing. I think it's a very short novel, extremely tightly plotted and, and everything fits, the, all the characterization and all the plot, it all fits together and it's just perfect, almost perfectly done. Um, and then they made it into a movie and the people who are making the movie clearly didn't understand what was supposed to be happening at each of those spots and put unnecessary and irrelevant things, missed the point of certain key scenes. So I think that's why everybody gets so excited and, and puts, you know, why we're, and is so disappointed when it doesn't go well about the, the film adaptation because they want that full visual reality of the story. Um, see, I, I want to take it, I want to approach it slightly differently. Um, the way I read literature is I'm primarily focused on characters. So I really like characters. So if there is no character that interests me, I will not read it. I will not read it. And now the the, but the way it is connected to plot for me is that I like characters who do things, yeah. you know, who are doing, uh, you know, who are trying to do something ambitious. And by its nature, that leads to a plot. It leads to a conflict. It leads to resolution of conflict. So it's like, I think in terms of like character first, then kind of plot and obviously kind of theme comes with the character uh, it's associated with the character and style kind of you know it, it has to kind of carry itself so that's why i i like um victor hugo's plots but even more i like his view of human beings yeah and i think that is far more profound than his ability to actually you know carry out because even when he portrays something like an urchin, street urchin, or he portrays the villain, you can see, oh, that's a grand person. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what human beings are. And that comes through everything that he does. And as a result of that, so that's, that's how I, I, I think about it. All right, so folks, what I'm going to do is that uh, we're going to do a slightly different procedure. I found that after the breakout rooms where, where people have had a chance to bounce their questions and comments off each other, when they come back, they have actually much more interesting things to say and to ask. So we're going to do the breakout rooms first, after which we are going to uh, come back and continue. So that's a way of kind of vetting your questions, then bring <laughs> your best questions and then we will take them all, starting the breakout rooms now. All right, welcome back folks. So now it's time for takeaways and questions. So uh, what you can do is if you would like to share a takeaway, so you can do one of two things uh, or both. <laughs> one is you can talk about what, what, what did you learn today? And second, you can ask a question. Um, and you are, I would recommend do both. And we're gonna put everything together, especially the questions, and then panelists will answer that. Uh, I'm not going to call on people for doing that. If you would like to do that, go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat, and we'll take as many questions as we can. All right, so this is your chance. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark to talk about, to do both takeaways or questions. Joe, you're first, go ahead. Um, so really quickly, just the idea of plot theme and thinking about that in general. Um, mm -hmm. I had not thought about it from that perspective. And uh, actually, similarly to Rob, they, they did try an attempt to make business school people writers uh, where I worked one place. They, they failed. So you, you can actually go there with, you know, with, <laughs> and, and, and glow uh, to Deloitte and Touche, but if if you'd like, but uh, I mean, it, it, the idea that the the first thing they taught us was the idea of Aristotle's approach to storytelling, mm -hmm. and it was very similar in the sense that you know you had your uh, your incentive, 
your climax and your resolution. And if you had to have a resolution, right, because you're solving some problem and you have to, you know, the unraveling and everything, the build up to it. So, and I'm, but I'm thinking about that. How much has storytelling really changed since then? And I, I can't really find much in the sense that I, I don't see a difference in storytelling from Aristotle's time to now what and, I, and the importance part of that. So, okay. Well, I actually have something to say there. Oh, sorry. Were you going to take questions? Sure, sure. What we'll do is that let everybody put their questions and observations on the table. Uh, I'm keeping track of all of them. Uh, so Joe has two, one about plot theme and second about how is it, it has changed uh, and we'll list all the questions and then you guys can take as many questions as you want. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next up, is a Lloyd, Les, and uh, Rupali. Lloyd. Okay, thanks. Um, great discussion, as always. Uh, you folks are, are some serious uh, intellectuals here, uh, so uh, I appreciate it very much. Very deep uh, conversation. The only thing I would say is that if I was to describe this book to somebody else, uh, I wouldn't call it a book. Uh, it's a collection of essays. Uh, when I hear the term book, it sort of connotes that it was written as a whole, and this was not. This is a collection of essays. This is not a book. Uh, essays written at different times for a magazine. So um, it, it doesn't hang together as well as a book might. Um, and one thing I find frustrating about this collection of essays is that Sometimes she reveals a lot of interesting stuff, and sometimes it's frustratingly the same thing that I've heard before from like a high school literature class. So um, I do think if you describe this to someone, it is a collection of essays. Don't call it a book. It's not a book. Okay. Uh, thank you, Les. Uh, thank you, Lloyd. Uh, next up is Les, followed by Rupali. Les. Yeah. Um, the one that I guess one thing I noticed. Uh, is that um, I guess you yourself, Shukrant, when you were relating Beethoven and the four movements and stuff mm -hmm. to this plot theme sort of idea and the connection and the integration. Uh, another thing I was, it comes to mind with myself is that um, I, um, in order to dramatize that, in order to make it fully real and you know, for me, um, um, I found that uh, by organizing I've got some Van Gogh prints and I picked four prints and one of them is the Reaper, you know, where he's sewing out in the field. And another one is the Stormy Sea. I think he was like Norwegian or something where you got, you know, he's in that boat and they, the waves are really high and, you know, and then up in the top, there's the cafe just outside of Paris, uh, you know, where everything looks quiet, but it really isn't. And then at the end, you've got the drawbridge and the woman crossing the drawbridge, everything's nice and peace and quiet. And I look at that series of four prints. I can sometimes look at that every day when I'm looking at getting my mind around, okay, if I'm in trouble here or having conflict, whatever it is, I look at those four prints together, those four Van Gogh prints, and it just brings it all together to me, you know, the theme, the plot, the integration and that no matter what, Les, you can solve this issue. And that, you know, expect that turbulence that, you know, like the waves and the, and the stormy seas and, and okay, yeah, look up at the Paris Cafe and everything looks quiet, but hey, don't underestimate what maybe we really going on here, you know? It's not obvious because remember in Paris, they had that terrible tragedy with that terrorist bombing, you know? So I put that kind of just a little higher, just above the print on the on the sea. And then the final with the bridge, you know, just nice quiet stream, a woman walking across the, the, the drawbridge at that time, you know, just brings the peaceful setting. So just saying, hey, if you put your mind to it, expect conflict in life, but you can resolve it, you can do it. Wow, Les, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was one, wonderful. Uh, next up is uh, Rupali. Um, and if anybody else wants to ask a question or share their takeaways, 
can go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark. Rupali, go ahead. So I'm going to piggyback on what Les just said. Uh, you know, so one of the things that um, great novels or great pieces of art do is that they um, kind of exaggerate the human achievement or what is really possible. I think uh, Ayn Rand talks about Aristotle's um, perspective on this as fiction being what it might be or ought to be. And what are those high ideals? So what are those, it, it doesn't even have to be higher ideals, right? It could just be the values that you uh, pursue in your own lives. And so, um, you know, all these art forms that have existed, whether they are religious or uh, non-religious art forms, they all have some universal themes that keep coming again and again uh, throughout centuries. So, I always wonder, you know, how consuming artwork, whether it's in form of music, literature, or um, paintings, sculpture, can build our own character and can build our own resilience, um, or can create a purpose for our own lives, you know, is it, because it's such a reflective um, occupation to, to consume art. It's not a passive, uh, just your going by things you're actually thinking about. You know, how does it uh, help me resolve my own inner conflicts? And these great lessons are presented through, through these epics or through uh, wonderful stories where the characters have to resolve those conflicts themselves. So that's my question and takeaway. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rupali, that was great. Uh, thanks. Next up is uh, Jonathan, Dave and Ash. Jonathan. Yeah, so my takeaway is the importance of plot in actually revealing the psychological motivation of a character down to its deepest core, which is what I got from Rob and actually made me realize that why I get certain things from some books and why in some others that I'm even currently reading now, I'm not as, I don't have as much insight into the main character. Um, and my question is about, she talks about um, plot reflecting something that happens in reality, meaning it's not a contrivance, she says. It's like in real life, events do follow a logical progression. It's just not a, as quickly as they do in a novel. She says something like the events of men's lives follow the logic of men's premises and values. Um, and then she gives the example of someone looking up at a wall and saying a map to a city is useless versus the pilot who can see the map because he's stepped away. He can see the bigger picture and he can see that, okay, the map has a value. Um, and so I'm wondering about that. Like when I see lack of realism in fiction, like if I see a character suddenly do something that doesn't make sense, is that an example of like s the author has some conflicting, uh, premises or like ideas. Um, and then also this is, uh, this is probably an optional question cause it's going to going a bit off tangent, but like, how do I, like, how do, how do I work that out in my mind when you've got, you know, everyone has like conflicting ideas and all of that. So she's saying that, and I get that's true in a, in a, in a book, but in real life, is it, do you guys think it's like that? And how do you make sense of that? That's my question. Okay. Um, uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry. I did not get it clearly. So can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's probably not as clear in my head. That's why it's, I, I need to think about it a bit more, but it sounds like she's, she, her idea of plot is based on she thinks in, in real life, there, there is a plot in a sense, like our ideas have mm -hmm. consequences over time. So it's exploring that. I, I can't put it in a great question because I need to think about it more, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Next up is Dave followed by Ash. Thanks very much, Shikant. And thanks, uh, Sherry, Rob, and Joya. To me, uh, almost any artwork I think could be enjoyed but I would say I would make the description superficially, but to look deeper, to understand why the creator did what they did and understand the subtleties. Uh, I give the example of watching a movie the second time, you start picking up on uh, the subtleties and you know this is a foreboding of what's going to happen. Uh, but I really enjoy the presentation. And at some point, I want to hear Rob give a dramatic reading of the periodic table. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he can do that, you know. I, I I've not seen him do that yet, but uh, you know, he he he'll be able to do that. I'm I'm sure. Here we have hydrogen. Here we have oxygen. Yeah. Yes, and it he has to bring the entire history of what that element does for human to beings. Each in sub, the to each item, yeah. Yes. We can work on that. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay. Next up is Ash. Yeah, uh, so just to comment on what Dave just said about, you know, like picking up the subtleties when you see a movie a second time or something. To me, that's actually one of the marks of a great work of art is when it's something that doesn't just bear kind of repetition or repeated uh, viewings, but that actually gets better the more that you watch it because there's so much there that you can't take it all in just in one uh, viewing. But uh, anyway, but Shurka, I'm totally with you that characterization to me is kind of the most important aspect of the work of literature that you know, even if like the, the theme and the plot and the, the style all are, you know, really fantastic or at a high level, but the characters, I, I, if I can't stand the characters, like I just, I cannot enjoy the book. So like Gone with the Wind or Anna Karenina, like those are hard for me because of the characters I could not <laughs> relate to at all. But, uh, but so that's kind of my takeaway, I guess, is you know, the, the discussion of characterization and Rob mentioned where Ayn Rand talks about how a character has to be, a great character has to be simultaneously, you know, sort of universal and have the, the particularity of, you know, a, a individual. And so it's like, they have the vividness and depth of somebody that, it, of a real person, but also they embody these universal traits that you can um, apply to lots of other people that you know in real life. Um, but the second aspect of literature to me after characterization would probably be style. And that brings me to my question, which is style is, even though like I can, you know, kind of point out, you know, like some, some books that, you know, I love the style of this book and I hate the style of this book. Style is sort of the most elusive of these aspects of literature, I think, because like in a way it's simultaneously the most abstract and the most concrete because it, it's conveying the author's sense of life, but it's doing so by means of like very particular word choices and things like this. So, so my, I guess my question would be, you know, I'd like to hear more of a discussion of style and how it sort of integrates with the other aspects. And uh, I don't know, just like kind of- Excellent, excellent question, perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we can go ahead and uh, start. Uh, if anybody else wants to add anything, you can do that. Otherwise we're going to go one by one. Um, so I just want to say one thing, um, you know, I've studied these great ideas uh, and kind of think, you know, thinkers on every topic. Art is actually unusual because Aristotle's poetics really founds it. It's almost out of nothing. He just starts and he has this amazing, amazing things to say. And it remains as the best thing for a long, long time. So I think Aristotle, there is a lot that, um, you know, that Ayn Rand draws upon Aristotle on one hand in terms of understanding of art, and then from Victor Hugo um, as, you know, as the best illustration of that. Um, so we can go ahead and now start with questions. So Joe's question was on plot theme and what has changed in storytelling over time. I have something to say about what has changed over storytelling over time. And I was actually in the, the small group with Joe and, and we started talking about Aristotle. And I definitely want to second that uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Aristotle. I think everybody who's interested in art should and ought to read the poetics. And I even remember a, a scholar that I had read who was doing this really grand survey of, it was literary criticism, but it could really apply to art criticism broadly. And he was pointing out all of these different developments and things that had changed. And he had this line where he pretty much said, yeah, but Aristotle pretty much had it all. So I think it's definitely worthwhile to go back to Aristotle in terms of thinking about the theory of, of literature or art. But as to the question of how literature itself has changed, one of the biggest changes that I think is fascinating uh, in literature is precisely the depiction of inner psychology. So if you even think back to the Greek plays and the form of the Greek plays, uh, if you even maybe learned this in, in high school or college, you might, you might remember that you think of Oedipus, for example, and there's always the Greek chorus. And the chorus has this function to really get you into perhaps the motivation of the character. And there really is not a, a great depiction at that point of the real inner psyche or the inner battle of the characters. And as 
literature advances and progresses, and especially once we get to the 19th century and, and these novels, what an author is able to do to really take us into the inner world of a character in a very self-reflective way, to me, that even remains one of the, the primary benefits of reading literature. It's the aspect of a novel that a movie can never really capture. The movie can, can concretize and bring to life the visuals and the setting, but it can't take you into the mind of a character the way that you can get into the mind in terms of the words of the character the way that that a novel can and I think it's just one of the the fascinating ways that storytelling has, has definitely evolved over the centuries. I want to add one thing to that um, I think the style offers a view into the operation of the mind um, like nothing else the biggest, the most stunning observation on that that I've seen is the difference between Iliad and Odyssey mm. uh, by, uh, this was Julian Jaynes. He looks at passages and the way in which Iliad does things and uh, Odyssey does things is dramatically different. In Iliad's things happen to you. There are these gods that are acting through you. Whereas there is a self-consciousness in Odysseus a very deep level of self-consciousness. So there is a jump in the, you know, in the, in the extent to which people were focused on consciousness and understanding of will and understanding of self-awareness that just went a quantum leap and you can see that. So a, a great observation. Uh, uh, Rob or Sherry, would you like to add anything? Mm -hmm. are, are we doing our, this our, and our wrapping up or is there, are we? Answering that question. Which question about the evolution? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Because I, I didn't know if we were on that or moved on. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think I'm not an expert on the history of this sort of thing. I, I do think that the issue of, generally speaking, Western literature and Western culture in general becomes much, much more introspective as you go along. There are some points mm -hmm. where it becomes too introspective and it, it degenerates, it becomes very navel gazing. Um, but that really is, you know, every at every stage, what's going on is you're getting deeper and deeper into introspecting into what are our motivations, what do we really think, how does the mind work, and bringing that more and more to the forefront. Uh, the Greeks were very outward focused and did not spend a lot of as much time on that. The Romans even more so. So yeah, I think that that is the the key development that's happened over the last couple thousand years is more introspection into fundamental motivations. And, uh, and to how your mind is thinking through things. Um, and I, I, I wanna also say, I have a, you mentioned style. I, have a, I could do a whole extra thing on style at some point if you want. Uh, I've done it from the nonfiction writer's perspective, but um, a Joy may remember something I used to do in writing classes where <laughs> I would give people assignments to say, you know, come up with many different synonyms as you can, different words to use to say, my, opinion, my opponent's position is wrong. Like it could be false, it could be in error, it could be, you know, you, you come as many as you can. And, and typically, you know, one of the more ambitious students would come in with 30 or 40 different ways. And of course, I had the master list, which was, is at 288 and counting. And, you know, because there, there's, this is vast, you know, English is a huge language, there's 600,000 words or more in it. Uh, there are so many different ways you can write so many different little shades of meaning that you use. So it's a whole vast field that we can go into. Okay, excellent. No, I, I would love, love to do that. Uh, let's take the next question. This will be a very quick question. So Lloyd asked, is this a book or a collection of essays? Mm. And why is it that she talks, she talks some, about some things which are there in the textbooks, high school textbooks, and some things that are new? Why are they all mixed up? Any, any thoughts? My only thought is, is Lloyd, that, that was fighting words because the, <laughs> the only book I've published is a collection of essays that were written one at a time for a magazine. So... <laughs> It's a book still. It's got, it's got a it's got a cover, it's got, it's got a back cover, it's got pages, pages in between. In between. It's a book. <laughs> I'll just go. Definitely a collection of essays, but but to the second point about why there's there's such a range of what she seems to cover, um, I, my understanding of, of the, the the genesis of this project was she was presenting some of her thoughts about fiction to an audience that included people who were both uh, either authors themselves or are working or aspiring authors and people who were just completely clueless about fiction, but maybe had read The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged and liked those books. So she was really trying to accommodate a, a, a wide audience 
audience of people who maybe didn't even get the high school lesson to people who were uh, practicing artists. Okay. And w- what I would say is that I'm, I'm actually a very big fan of this kind of works because I take the responsibility of putting the integration, uh, doing the integration myself, no matter what book I'm reading. And I'm trying to pull together everything from every source anyway, multiple books and multiple things. So for example, it's crucial to do the basics in a, you know, and to present the basics, even when you're, you know, presenting uh, new ideas. And yes, you pick, pick things up from, from us. So that's a, that's a small um, point. I, I want to talk about that next one is less. I was really intrigued by the way in which he talked about using art, um, using art as a, as a way of thinking, actually, as a method of thinking, as a way of, for you to make sure that you've covered all the bases. So using art, you know, choosing art pieces carefully to map out all the things that you need to focus on. And art gives you a very powerful way of focusing on that mm-hmm. and putting it together in a, in, on a wall. So you have these four things in the wall and then using it in problem solving. So any, any thoughts, any comments on that? I think that's the power of art. Um, it is literally a tool um, for our daily use and it is a fuel for our souls. And that's an absolutely perfect way of doing it. I do that. I, I want to add something to that because, you know, we've got two boys, age 11 and 13, and they're at an age where, you know, we're going out and finding, we, we're, we can, we're partly at their age, we can still influence on what they read and, and, and watch. And, uh, you know, one of our key things is like, you know, what we want shaping their sense of life, what we want shaping their characters, what kind of people they're going to become. Because, you know, I can tell you that the stuff they see that they watch, it sticks in their heads. Oh, they'll use it as a <laughs> daily event, you know, uh, it'll, it, you can see in a child and the way that they're talking about what they're doing, um, you know, they see some kid do something at school that's, they disagree with, and they'll make reference to something we talked about or some character in a book. They'll, they yeah. do that at a very young age. Well, um, I can see, I could, they will talk a lot about something they've seen or something they've yeah. read. And it, it, it's, it takes a lot of space in their heads and there's a lot of processing going on there. Uh, following up on that, um, Rupali's point about how art is a way of, you know, consuming art is a way of building your own character. Mm-hmm. Any, any thoughts on that? Is Joya on muting? Um, no, I mean, I, I was just going to hope that, that Sherry and Rob were going to continue because it seems like they're, they're telling this exact story with, with even, and I'm even curious to hear their approach to this as parents, um, as being the people who are trying to shape someone, someone's experience of art and the way that art will then shape their character um, and maybe how you think about that as parents. Yeah, we actually, um, long before we had kids, had long discussions about this. Um, and it's really amazing. A lot of people <laughs> talk about, um, we've heard lots of parents at, at birthday parties with the parents sit around and chat for the, you know, hour and a half that they, <laughs> they get without babysitting. Um, and they talk about the awful things that their kids are listening to or reading or things like that. Um, you don't have to so much, um, look to insulate your child from, the world, all you really need to do is to show them the power of good art and they'll reject the other stuff on their own. So, so one of the things is that we're on the high end of engaged parenthood uh, because we know we're (laughs) part of we're self-employed. We get to spend a lot of time with our kids. I think, you know, a lot of things that happens is people let their kids be raised by popular culture, oftentimes because they don't have the time to be engaged. Uh, So park the kid in front of the TV and he watches whatever. Uh, whereas we've had more, we've more engaged in having more control and more in presenting more, having more influence over it. But the biggest thing I've done is uh, I spend, have spent many, 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 many hours reading to the kids. Yeah. So it's something we started doing that wouldn't, uh, again, the privilege of being self-employed when we were taking the kids into school on the car ride on the way in, we would drive them into school together. And in the car ride on the way in, Sherry would be driving and I would be reading from a story. In, all, in many different voices. So I've read the entire Harry Potter series aloud. 
Are you Fred? Uh, um, doing, this Hank, was, doing all the characters, of course. You want to give him a little Dobby? No, no, that's okay. Oh, um, I'll wreck my voice doing Dobby. Yeah, but we've also read, um, I mean, most of us, the boys <laughs> get to make choices on this, but we also pull the plug and say, no, we're going to read this and we'll bring in our things. And for a little while- But it's not while, about so much about restricting things because if, you know, if, especially if you're reading it to them, you can say, oh, well, let's find a story they really like and mm -hmm. read it to them. And, and they're going to be so engaged. They're not even going to care about what else. Mm -hmm. so. So we've um, we've done this with music too. We 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 don't specifically um, play only classical music or something weird like that. Um, we have a pretty wide variety of music that we my, play. Our, my kids have become classical music snobs. But they I have. swear I did not put them up to it. No. <laughs> so um, they, and because they'll listen to pop music that their friends are listening to, and they'll say, "But there's only three chords." <laughs> and it just repeats itself over. I, Actually, yeah, the big thing, I, I I did something on this. I keep hearing it back to me. I was like, yeah. wow, because there's a lot of popular music songs. We realize there's only 15 seconds of actual music. And, it's but, like, you know, and, and it just repeated over and over again. And they, they've started telling that back to me. So, I mean, the, I think the biggest takeaway is um, because I, I, I get a lot of um, people concerned that you know, the culture is so awful out there. You've got to try to, it's such an uphill task. It really isn't because now more than even in, Zoom, even in the Zoom world of, you know, kid, our kids are learning half the time at home because of the way their school's working. Um, even in the world when you're stuck in your own house, there's so much available to us now. It's not the same as seeing it in person, um, but it's still so much better than any other time in history. Um, there's so much access to the good stuff. And frankly, the searching for the good stuff is half the fun because when you find something that uh, you didn't know existed before, that's really, that's, that's, that's treasure hunting. Actually, I just realized that about seven years ago, I wrote uh, an article, sort of like a holiday gift giving guide uh, of book recommendations for kids in like the five, three to eight, three to seven year old range, which is because that's, you know, what we'd experience at the time. I should probably update it at some point, but yeah. I might post a link to this. What were you going to say? You're going to say something? Well, about I, was just, I just looked it up to make sure I could find it here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but really, um, it's, it's not, the art does it for you, for you. You don't have to do the work um you can talk about the art with a child way beyond and Rupali will talk about this as a Montessorian um don't put limits on what a child can understand or not understand um really really young children will respond to a work of art um probably in a way that's at a deeper um, more honest level in many ways than us later on when we put in all these boxes in our heads because children will go straight to the emotion and go straight to the gut um, because they don't have that filter yet um, but you really don't you don't it's not a it's not a big scary thing it's it's just the the world is out there um, there's great stuff in all fields um, you just need to expose them and let them run well um, next question is from Jonathan Jonathan I'm going to let you ask the question yourself couldn't do a good job. Okay, of I can, I might still not, I might still struggle, but I think I'm, I've sort of thought it over and it's a bit closer, but I was wondering about when you see like lack of realism in a story, like something doesn't make sense. A character acts in a way is like, no one would do that. Or they tie events together and you're like, that wouldn't happen. Does that reflect something in the, in, in her view of plots being reflecting a logical progression of ideas so is there a connection there because the author something is off with the author's ideas he can't make it work so it kind of gets it puts it together in this unrealistic way is there some connection there I don't know if that question is clearer but um, that's what I uh, maybe I'll give an example so I was reading a book recently a Japanese fiction book it's historical fiction and there's this character who throughout the whole book is just seeking revenge and she's blind to anything else she almost kills someone in her in her desire to get this revenge to a get avenge the dishonor to her family. And then at the end, she suddenly just has this moment where like, oh, you know, like, you know, I, I was doing wrong the whole time. And it's just so unbelievable because it's throughout the 900 pages that you've read till then, that's what she was like. And so I was wondering if that's 
if that's a reflection in like contradictory something like something there it doesn't just doesn't work like why does that happen i don't know if that's any clearer but no that actually does clear it up so you're so this happens i i, I don't know what book you're talking about but so there is no plot event that occurs that causes her to make this shift it just happens well, it well it, there is a plot event like uh someone almost dies but given the rest of the story it just doesn't make any sense at all and so yeah, when you get things like event. that in books i'm wondering what what that is yeah that seems to me like it would be what ayn rand describes as a as the plot and the characterization not being integrated so that there's that doesn't one doesn't flow naturally from the other See, I thought you were going to ask, I thought you were getting, to, you were asking about um, something more about how as readers, if we don't get the conflict in a character, and I was thinking about Dominique, um, Dominique, Franken, <laughs> Dominique in Franken in the Fountainhead, um, because I still, I mean, I understand her now, but when I first read the book, it was, she's, I totally didn't get her. Um, uh, and it took me many years to kind of get us to, for it to make sense, but I still at a, at a, at a sense of life level, I understand her, but I don't <laughs> get her. If you know what I mean? My sense of, I, I don't, I can't, I can't get there to understand her at that level. Um, but I think what you're talking about is, is, a mismatch between um, this is an example of of when an inter when 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 you don't have integration between two parts that makes it less or less valuable of a work. So imagine if there was say a Hugo esque like event that made uh, this change in her way of living that really made it make sense then it would be so much more powerful right and now it's like huh meh so that's not that i think that's an example of a work of art without that great integration um it is it's it's a value but it's not as powerful yeah it's, I, i'm thinking of it in terms of humor like i mean like for example in hugo's kind of thing there is an initial surprise, but then it immediately gets resolved because, oh, that's why. So that it, it's kind of a dramatic event. So that causes surprise. And then you understand why it happened. And then it makes perfect sense. It's kind of like humor. Like humor also works like that, that there is a surprise and then you say, aha. But it's kind of like you know, the, what Jonathan is describing. It's like, it would be an attempt at a humor where you say, what? And you never stop then that that's it you know there is no kind of closing back yeah i was saying sometimes in older literature there were conventions that a story is supposed to end in a certain way and i think sometimes you get i don't know what the how old this piece is that you're looking at but i think there's sometimes where the author will write a whole long thing and then it ends in a certain way because it's supposed to end that way but he didn't really make it logically end that way it just it did it because it's supposed to because it's because them's the rules and not because it actually flowed from what he did before. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is one uh, quick uh, aspect that uh, Dave brought up is the fact that if you read something multiple times, you kind of get keep getting more and more out of it. So any any thoughts about it? Like, are there books that you read multiple times? I, I will ask it to Joya because Joya, I'm sure, is dying to answer this question. Mm -hmm. Are there books that you read multiple times? And what happens every time? And how? why does that happen? So there are definitely books I read multiple times, but I, I wanted to say something too about uh, Jonathan's question, because one of the interesting things there is when you ask, well, why wasn't there that integration that we're looking for? Was it that the author didn't understand something about human psychology? So like that was why? Was it that the author, there was something about the style of the writing that was missing? And interestingly, it's oftentimes both. And this, I think, even is going to get into our question about style and why style is so fascinating. Uh, because sometimes if there is something that's wrong with the author's style, it, it's somehow connected or reflective of a, a deeper misunderstanding uh, in, in just their basic understanding of reality. So just wanted to throw that out there before we get to the question about style. But to the point about rereading books, um, I definitely reread books. Uh, 
partly there's I, Ash made that great point that that uh, a really rich work has so much going on that you can't take it all in the first time. So you you have to go through just to to appreciate all the details and the subtleties. And one of the things I find is that uh, great works of art are too, are wonderful in that they provide a benchmark for how you change. So I was recently having this fascinating conversation with a friend. We were talking about the Lord of the Rings, the movies. And this is an example where I personally do think that the movies are better than the books in terms of, of a work of art. That, that's my personal opinion. But we're at that point now where it's been almost 20 years since the trilogy of the movies came out. And we've each just, you know, gone from, let's say, young adulthood to more middle adulthood in, in that time period. And so in re-watching the trilogy again and watching that trilogy, especially now in, in 2020, we were having a fascinating conversation in terms of how the way we were responding to things in that series is different now and how much of that is reflective of perhaps the mood that we're in now in 2020 going into 2021. And that's a real, I think, one way in which a work of art is really valuable because there are just things that are momentarily happening in your life now where that great work of art will shine a light that you perhaps weren't paying attention to, but now it is really salient because of what's happening. And then how much more are you getting out of it because you've changed, because it has been almost 20 years and you're in a different stage of life and there's more things that you know about the world and yourself. And so in going through that, that book again, and, and the very fact that the work remains the same, it remains the, the constant benchmark and touch point, and it provides that, that way for you to, to reflect on what it is about you and your experience that's been changing. Wonderful. Um, speaking, speaking of Lord of the Rings, somebody said in the uh, in the comments here, in the text comments, the best part of parenting is experiencing quality children's literature, mm. and the best part of having boys is having an excuse to leap to read Lord of the Rings as a grown adult, <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> Wonderful. So we'll come to the last question now, which is actually the most complex of the questions, and that is about uh, style. So Ash, can you go ahead and restate the question about style? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, so I guess the question was just, to me, style seems like simultaneously one of the most powerful elements of, of art, but also one of the most elusive because it's it seems to be simultaneously the most abstract and the most concrete element or aspect of, of literature that Ayn Rand is analyzing this chapter because an author has to, you know, simultaneously is expressing an author's sense of life, which is kind of their, you know, very generalized uh, sense of life in the universe, but it's doing so through the very concrete means of their specific word choices and sentence structures and, and all of those kinds of things. So I was just wondering if uh, any of the panelists wanted to speak more to that and like how exactly style uh, integrates with those other um, aspects of literature and how it uh, helps literature achieve uh, what it does. I have one thing I want to say about that, um, which is I think it ties into the question about why, how, do you, how is it you get so much more out of reading some books, reading them again and again, you can get more each time. And something was said about acting that if you do it right, nobody knows you're doing it. Uh, and uh, you know, that it, if you are achieving, you know, a really good author achieving certain emotional effects is doing so by, very complex and subtle manipulations that you're not paying attention to. You're just being carried along by it. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why, uh, <coughs> why style can be very complex and diffuse because it consists of all the things that you don't notice while you're, mm -hmm. that you're not supposed to notice. It's, it's all the stuff that's happening backstage. <laughs> the author is carefully managing this experience for you by, and you, what you don't see is the, the seven different words that the author thought of using and threw out and decided to use this other word instead because that was much better than the others. Um, so you, don't, you sort of don't see the technical process behind it, the special effects, the making of the special effects that you don't see that. You, you see, and if he does it right, you're being carried along so naturally by the, the, by the finished product that you don't notice all the details that go into it. Mm -hmm. I think also um, style is getting into, like, like Ash has said, um, it is 
a, like a direct pipeline to the artist or author's sense of life. Um, so there is quite possibly um, a level of subconsciousness going on. Oh, you know, you pick the word because it's right, not because, not necessarily because you've thought through it every single way. It just feels right, you know? Um, and that sounds wishy-washy, but um, my guess is Ayn Rand probably knew exactly what she was doing with every single word, but still when she calls to mind, what word am I using? What word do I, how do I describe this? Um, a good artist, those are the tools that they manage. They, it's like a piano player who learns how to play and then they just play. Those things just come out when an artist is working. And so she is probably just, it's letting that flow. When she's writing, those are the words that just come out because they're right to her. Or when a painter is painting, that's just the way that they're painting. It's, it's, so you're, you're really getting to your direct pipeline to that subconscious sense of life mm -hmm. at that point. That's why it's so abstract and concrete at the same time. We, it's hard to analyze. We had a whole meetup about this with Shrikant, with me and Shrikant. I don't think you were there, uh, where we talked about how as a writer, you have to constantly go back and forth between the subconscious and the conscious. Mm -hmm. You absolutely, you, you cannot think out every word. You have to rely on the subconscious, but then you have to kind of come back with the conscious and say, oh, wait, that word's not quite right. Let's Something doesn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was actually thinking um, when we were earlier in the week trying to think of um, what points we should each take out of this chapter. I was thinking uh, her her discussion of style. I was thinking that it would be good to. She talks about this issue of it being both uh, concrete and um, abstract at the same time. So concrete that it, what swears the word. Um, let me find it here. Oh, I missed it. Where did it go? Um, do you remember, Ralph? Which one? So concrete, her discussion of style. So concrete, a figure has to be an abstraction, yet look like a concrete. Yes. Um, I was thinking that a way we could um, go and observe that happening would be in a piece of portrait sculpture. Um, but then I, then we, we thought it would be better to do something else, but that might be a way that we can kind of get into, um, the way, because the style in an, in a character of a novel takes place over the entire novel. So it's a long, long drawn out bit of tiny little details. Uh, but in a piece of portrait sculpture, that character, it's, it's a portrait, so it's a specific <coughs> person. Um, all of that style is brought to bear in that piece of sculpture, and it hits you all at once instead of the length of a novel. Um, so it might be an interesting way to start looking, maybe you can each do that, um, at a piece of portrait sculpture that you like and say, how am I learning from the style who this person is? Not just the specific parts that maybe that's more like the plot, but the style of that piece of portrait sculpture. How is those little tiny itty bitty details giving you both the concretes, but also the abstractions of who that person is? I, I, I want to respond to what Ash just wrote here in the chat. Um, he said, it's like her comparison between the original and rewritten scene from The Fountainhead. I'm sure when she originally wrote it, she didn't have to think about every word choice, but with the rewritten version, she probably did. My sense is even what I love about that rewritten version, Rob described how what you don't see is the seven different words that the author considered and threw out. In my sense, that's even, I think, what we're seeing in the rewritten version, probably the, the different variations 
limitations of the ways that she could have, um, you know, written some of the the work dialogue, and and it gets to why she chose some of the particular words that she did because it would either emphasize aspects of his character or even make the character who he is. The, the part of what comes out even in that rewritten scene is that you know there's certain things that work just wouldn't ever say or wouldn't think to say because it wouldn't be part of his character. And I want to second, Rob had mentioned that he, he had done previously this whole presentation about style, and I would love to see Rob do the, the latest and greatest version of it. Uh, because one of the big takeaways I remember that I got from that was just even to a certain extent, you can't separate style from content that, that, that ultimately what ends up in the style reflects the content. So I, I would love to see the uh, 2021 updated version of that presentation. <laughs> that, would, that would be great. Uh, you know, okay. looking forward to that. We'll, we'll, we'll plan on that. Um, Rupali, you had a uh, you had an observation about style. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that you know, <clears throat> when an artist uh, expresses their thoughts in any form of art, it requires a lot of practice to develop that style. So, say if you're doing literature, you know, um, the the first parts are the technical parts, just the elements of writing, the elements of style. And if it's painting, again, the composition and all the technical elements. So first the artist has to master those elements or those technical elements, and then the style will naturally flow. And um, <clears throat> I think that uh, for any of us, a good exercise would be to read uh, or, or to see works of art that have the style that uh, appeals to you and kind of try to even replicate it and then see, you know, how, how, do, you, um, how do you develop your own style? It's, uh, it's a lot of practice. Right, excellent. So uh, folks, this was, this was fantastic. I just wanna let you know that immediately after this, we are going to do the planning for Q&A uh, Q&A uh, version of the meetup. So um, if you have, especially if you have read the book uh, at some point and would like to talk about the concepts in great amount of detail, that's what we're going to do immediately after this meetup. So um, Robin Sherry, what's the next chapter? Hmm. The very next chapter is what is romanticism? All right. I have one. Finally, this is the Romantic oh. Manifesto, and we're finally going to talk about romanticism. <laughs> Wonderful. One thing I also want to do is I think everybody's everybody's homework assignment. If oh, you haven't done this already, yes. if, aside from actually reading this book, the the number one thing you can do to get the most out of this is to catch up on some Victor Hugo. <laughs> now, the best thing is to read *The Miserable* because you get the full Victor Hugo experience, but it's fifteen hundred pages. If you can't do that, the fortunate thing is. There are now many, many adaptations and versions of this out there. And especially, I'm a big fan of the musical adaptation. Uh, and it's actually the interesting thing is within about six months of reading this book the first time, the touring company of uh, Le Miserable came to Chicago. So I got the full experience there. And it, I wanna discuss that in more detail later, but um, there, there's a movie version we just saw that leaves out a few things. It's, it has some, it, it, I don't know if it's the best version, but it's a pretty good version. It gives you an idea of the plot and the the the, uh, the themes and the the emotional power of it. Um, there's also online you can find there's a 10th anniversary concert. That's the one I was going to recommend. The 10th anniversary yeah. one I think is the best performance. Yes, it has, well, it has the original cast. It has uh, Cole Wilkinson as uh, as as Valjean, it's original. But it's better than the original cast because they really took the best of the original cast from the first 10 years and brought them all together. So I think that that is the best. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of Alan Armstrong, who does, who is the original Chenardier, because he just reeks every little bit of character out of that. Out of I, that I can't see it character. any other yes, way exactly. than with him in my so mind. So that's a good one. You, you probably want to have like a plot summary, like a Wikipedia plot summary to go with, to go into it with you, because they leave out a lot of the 
stuff in between that gives you what's happening in the plot. So if you have a plot summary into the 10th anniversary one, it's on YouTube, it's pirated there, I guess. Yeah, and you should easily be able to find that online because even when you go see the play, the actual play, they give you the plot summary because yeah. I think with Les Miserables, you do, you almost need to know the plot itself because there is so much going on. And yeah. then once you know that, you can appreciate the performances and, and the music it, and everything. Is, it began by a, as a concept album produced by a couple of guys, in, a couple of Frenchmen in French with all the lyrics in French. And it was basically, they could do this because if you went, I guess at that time, at least, if you went to high school in France, everybody read Les Miserables, so they, everybody knew the story. So they just said, oh, let's do a bunch of songs that you know sum up the story. And that was the origin of it. So it was coming from a context where everybody knows the story, we just, we just do the songs. So yeah, it helps to have the, the plot summary. Wonderful. All right. So, uh, so folks, uh, if you want to stick around for the Q&A, you are welcome to do that. But I'm going to say goodbye to Rob and Sherry. Uh, this was wonderful, uh, folks, and we'll see you a week from 